Well, hello, everybody. Hi, PK families. Welcome to our family webinar focused on supporting our gifted students in secondary. Um, so our goal for this webinar is for families to feel informed about PK's gifted program and understand PK's vision. So kind of like the why behind the what on supporting our gifted learners. And also, we want to be able to open up a line of communication about your learner. Um, and we encourage you to reach out to us after the webinar if you have specific things you'd like to talk to us about for your student. So for this webinar today, we are joined by our amazing Lisa Fabulich. And she is our sixth through 12th grade gifted teacher, along with other things. And I'll let her introduce herself. And so, um, before we get into that, just so we know too, if questions arise throughout the webinar, as they probably will, you can just type them in the Q&A section of the Zoom, and we'll be able to answer them as we go. And if they get backlogged, we'll make sure that we'll answer them at the end of the webinar. All right, take it away, Ms. Fabulich. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction, and it's nice to see you guys in here. I am going to share my screen so that we can um, be looking at the same thing together. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, as Ashley said, this really, I, I want us to think about this as a beginning and um, that, you know, we want this conversation to continue. And so, you know, I definitely welcome questions. And, and you know, as we said, if we don't get to them all in line, then uh, I'm happy to stay at the end and answer questions as well. Um, and again, hopefully this is only the first meeting that we get to have together. Um, so I am Lisa Fabulich. I am uh, here in Gainesville by way of, I grew up in Virginia and went to a small undergraduate school in Virginia and decided for grad school, I wanted that big university experience. So I found my way down here to Gainesville and it has just kind of drawn me back. <laughs> and so I started my first few years teaching actually here in um, at PK and I met my husband here and uh, brought him back up to Virginia with me for a few years. I taught at a high school in Virginia and then spent the last 13 years teaching at Florida Virtual School before making my way back here to PK Young. Um, my husband is also a teacher here at PK Young again too. He teaches seniors in government and economics and um, I am the parent of a fourth and sixth grade PK um, student. So, you know, I definitely, I, I feel like I come to all of this as both from that teacher lens, but also from, from the mama bear lens too. And so, you know, this is definitely, PK is, is a community that, that we are fully bought into and, and that we choose as teachers, but that we also choose as parents for our children. Um, and so it's, it's really a special thing for me to get to talk about our gifted program and not only what it is and what our services are, but why we do the things that, that we do and, and why this is, is how we run our, our program. So when we think about gifted, um, you know, just kind of think in your head, like, what are some of those first adjectives that come to mind as you talk about your gifted child or, um, you know, what it means to be gifted? And for all of us, I think we may see that we have different ideas of what our gifted kids, like those adjectives that pop in mind. Um, this graphic shows some of those. So it may be that you think smart logical, curious. Um, for a lot of people, those are some of the first words that come to mind. For others, it may be things like emotional, sensitive, intense. Um, you can see real kind of stark differences here in terms of, you know, maybe a rule follower, but also non-conforming. So as we look at this kind of word cloud, I think one of the things that comes to mind is that Gifted is not one thing. That gifted involves a lot of different elements and that because there's a lot of different elements, it's not really a one size fits all definition of what it means to be gifted. And so we can't just think about our gifted kids as what sometimes people on the outside think of, which is smart, capable, independent. That is often true, but it, 
just as equally true that our gifted kids are, um, you know, maybe overexcitable, have difficulties with learning as well. And so it's important to respect both sides of what it means to be gifted. So Florida defines gifted as students who have superior intellectual development and are capable of high performance. So as we can see, that definition, it really just scratches the surface. It's a really a one kind of element of that definition of giftedness. I wanted to take a minute just to kind of back up and talk about the gifted label and sort of where that comes from. Um, so sometimes kids ask like, who said I was gifted? You know, what does that even mean? And, um, and how did I get this label attached to me at some point? So gifted screening typically occurs in, in elementary levels where there are universal screenings done at different grade points. Um, these often look like picture tests, uh, something like it could be the Nagberry a nonverbal aptitude test or something similar that allows students, even young students who maybe aren't reading yet to still um, be able to answer these questions, to do things like identifying patterns in something, spatial reasoning. And so these sorts of universal screening tests are often done early in elementary school. And then from there um, may progress to full-scale IQ testing um, for that gifted determination. Additionally, um, aside from the universal screening, parents and teachers um, can always nominate students to be um, considered for gifted testing as well. So when we talk about a full-scale IQ or that intellectual quotient, we look at this as a bell curve. So our average IQ is 100, okay? And this represents the average IQ. Um, when we look at, at the determination of giftedness, um, we look in terms of standard deviations away from that average. So within one standard deviation of this average score of 100, we can be anywhere from 85 to 115 for an IQ score. And that represents about 68%, let's say 68% of our student population of um, you know, students that across the states or um, of just your average person would fall in that IQ range. Okay, one standard deviation above that would be in this um, superior range of 115 to 130. Once we get above the IQ of 130, that's representing two standard deviations above that mean, above that average. And that's where most schools use for, um, where the state of Florida in general uses for the cutoff IQ score for that gifted label. So sometimes what happens is that, you know, and I've seen this with teachers, with families, um, with, you know, just kind of people around, they say, well, if a student is that smart, then why do they need services? Like everything should be easier for them. But when we're looking at these IQ scores, we have to kind of, again, look at it in those standard deviations away from the average, from that normal range. And just like two standard deviations below that norm, an IQ of 70 or below, we may have that sense of like, okay, this person may have brain differences in terms of how their neural connections are functioning or how they may develop differently. Um, just as, you know, kind of on the flip side then, two standard deviations above the mean, we would want to think about as, okay, well, how are those brain connections, neural connections, how is that brain development occurring differently than our average? student, someone that falls within this um, kind of mid range. And so I always like to think about it kind of as those opposing sides that our students need services because their, their brains are developing differently than maybe someone in this um, central range of IQ scores. Certainly there are, are issues with IQ to begin with and with any kind of testing that we do, but this is where the state of Florida 
Um, and most states actually do use this as their determining factor. And so I think it is kind of helpful just to bring this up as that background information. So to me, the biggest hallmark of our gifted students and of that gifted label is this idea of asynchronous development. So our students, as they're developing, we know that they're developing different aspects of their um, of themselves. And so not only are we looking at, you know, maybe superior ability in verbal or math, but we need to consider all of these layers of how they are developing, how their brains are developing. So something that we see as a hallmark of giftedness is that you might have a student, um, and I'm going to refer back to this graph a lot because again, it is so important. Um, this black line is representing that ring of chronological age. So I'll, I'll give an example that this would be your average six-year-old, maybe at this black line. Well, your gifted child, maybe at six years old, was reading at a seventh grade level. Maybe they've blown through all of the Harry Potters and Percy Jacksons and, you know, all of their favorite books and are just voracious readers. That's just something where they have developed further than their, their same age peers have, okay? But at the same time, that same child who is showing this really strong um, ability and development in that verbal area may also fall apart when they lose a game of checkers at home, okay? And, you know, melts into, um, you know, a puddle. And so sometimes when that, those differences in development occur, when a student can speak like they're 13 when they're actually 12, we tend to kind of think of them as 13 and, you know, or 13 instead of six, we tend to think of them as 13 and not remember that they're six-year-olds who might even some be at a more emotional age of a four-year-old or a five-year-old in some parts of their development. And so it's recognizing that there are those differences. Um, additionally, you might have a student who is very highly progressed in their verbal, but maybe their math skills aren't much higher than where their same age level peers are. And that's important to see too, that, that giftedness isn't every element necessarily as being above an age level peer. Um, it can definitely be certain areas, maybe a special talent. Um, Another example I like to use with this, and I wish there was one more pie wedge to represent executive functioning or that ability to stay organized and kind of think about how they're thinking. Um, we see this a lot with students in math classes, for example. Students who are at a young age have really great natural number sense, sometimes struggle when they get to classes like algebra which requires very specific step-by-step -step processes. Um, you can't do some of that math work just in your head. And so it is a matter of kind of having to keep those that have that executive functioning part of your development in there to really reach that maximum potential of that, that math ability with that executive functioning. So I like to think about these different little pie wedges as kind of our, um, our foundation that we're building off of as we plan everything else that we do is that we really have to consider this idea of asynchronous development and really supporting our students in those areas where they may need a little help kind of lifting up to meet to their other abilities and make the most of those abilities where they're already really strong. Um, a lot of our gifted students do have issues with, you know, social and emotional kinds of, um, of things because sometimes, you know, especially at a young age, I think having those strong abilities for, for verbal and, and having those conversations, if their other peers same age aren't ha having those same conversations or don't have that same sense of humor or don't have that um, vocabulary, it can be a struggle to feel like you fit in. And so these are the things that we really try to um, try to address in our gifted programming and, and really try to get teachers to understand and, and families to understand and for the students to understand about themselves too, is that it's not fair to expect all of these areas of their development to be 
where maybe their particular special talent is, that we have to kind of help support those other areas as well. So kind of, you know, that's a little bit of the, the why for why our gifted students need services. So a little bit more of the what then of those services um, kind of comes down to, you know, what, do, what are some of these things that our gifted students need? So they need teachers that are trained in the nature and needs of gifted students. So these are conversations that we have with our teachers. Um, our gifted students need differentiated content related to real world problem solving. We know that gifted students want to know why am I doing this? And so we need to have those real world connections in our curriculum. Um, gifted students do need access to other gifted peers and they do need individualized supports, including social and emotional supports. And so as we continue in this webinar, I hope that you're gonna see how we are incorporating these needs into our actual services. So at this point too, I do like to talk about some of these uh, gifted myths or misconceptions and some um, of sort of more of the facts of gifted services. So again, this is one we've sort of talked about, that gifted students are high performers who require little support. And really that is a misconception. Sometimes that can be true, but very often gifted students struggle with various skills. Um, and many have challenges that make school difficult. A lot of our gifted students, not just ours, but in general, a lot of gifted students also have secondary exceptionality things like ADHD, anxiety, dyslexia. And so, you know, just having that gifted label doesn't mean school is easy. And that's important for us and for their teachers and families to understand um, that our gifted students do struggle. Um, the other one is that gifted students should be accelerated and given more work whenever possible to keep them challenged. So again, there are places where acceleration is a fitting opportunity, but I have seen gifted programs where the idea of more basically is the program, okay? And, and we wanna make sure that our gifted program isn't only involving more. So we need to consider the quality and diversity of learning experiences over just quantity or pace. We really need to develop that asynchronous development and support that because again, that is the foundation that we can build that more off of. But if we jump straight to the content, straight to that idea of more in providing our gifted student services and successes, then we're missing some of that foundational piece that I think is where you're going to have that more and those other uh, abilities really uh, have more meaning. So again, we all want our students to be successful. You know, I think as, as a parent, as a teacher, um, you know, there is nothing that I want more than to feel like my student is one happy, but also that they are prepared, that they are competitive, that they um, have what they need, have the tools that they need to have that potential for success, to be college and career ready when they get done with school. Um, I think it's important to know though that there are, are varying approaches to how we get to that success and how we prepare our students for that point. Um, so I'm a, I'm a sports person, I love sports, so forgive my sports analogy here. Um, back in, I think it was 2008, uh, Malcolm Gladwell came out with this book, um, The Outliers. And one of the effects of that book was that it really kind of brought to mainstream this idea of 10,000 hours. And that became a really big thing for a long time of um, that it takes 10,000 hours of dedicated practice to become successful at something. Um, there have definitely been some, some uh, various meta-analysis done of, of people afterwards and kind of thinking like, oh, this 10,000 hour thing might not be like the answer of all answers. Um, in 2019, uh, David Epstein wrote a book called Range. And I feel like, again, we could have an entire other webinar on book studies and everything, and I can geek out on that. But um, this book Range to me was amazing. Um, 
in this book, one of the first analogies that David Epstein gives is looking at Tiger Woods and Roger Federer. Um, I think we can both say that these guys are incredibly successful and represent, um, you know, kind of a, a pinnacle point in, in their respective sports. Um, Tiger Woods and Roger Federer both had parents that were coaches of their, their sports um, and were introduced to their sports at a young age. Um, Tiger had, you know, at two years old, I think he was on TV, you know, swinging a golf club and at eight, he could beat his dad in, in golf, in a round of golf. Um, Roger Federer, on the other hand, his mom honestly didn't want to be his tennis coach because he drove her crazy. Um, he didn't want to learn the specific techniques. He just wanted to go out there and hit weird trick shots and, and stuff. And he ended up kind of trying out lots of different sports. You know, he always kind of had it in the background, but he played soccer, he skied, he skateboarded, he had lots of other interests. Um, when he did have time, Talent, and he was actually encouraged a few times to move up to higher levels and play with other other kids that were older that would give him more of a, a challenge in his tennis playing. But each time he actually turned it down because he just wanted to stay with his friends and play with them because that's what made tennis fun for him. So you know, we fast forward, they have both reached amazing success in their sport. Um, you know, we can look at things like their physical and mental health, at, you know, at this point too, but I think the idea is that there are varying approaches to success, and there isn't one right answer for every student, and so the idea is that we want our, to set our students up for success, but we want to do that in the way that is most appropriate for them developmentally, and where they need to be for their, their mental health, their emotional health, and their enjoyment of school and their wanting to continue to pursue their academics. And so again, if you haven't read these books, and again, I would be happy to, <laughs> to do future things with them. Um, I, I loved this one. It, it really meant a lot to me. Um, but as we look to our future and to making our students college ready and career ready, um, you know, it's a little different now than it was maybe 30 years ago, 20 years ago, when, you know, we might have been entering our job force or going to college, um, that, that there, I mean, technology is right at our fingertips at any time. And so content, just that idea of being able to pull lots of content, we can do in, in a moment, we can ask theory and she'll tell us the answer to, to lots of, of content related things. So I think we're finding that in education in general, we're kind of moving away from just content because content, we, we are always going to be beaten by computers when it comes to how much information that we know and how quickly we can then pull that information out. Um, so Computing is always going to win for, for things like that. Where we want to look at is where do, where do we still have such a, an impact? And the brain is still winning when it comes to creativity, emotion, and empathy, planning and executive function, um, consciousness, just that idea of self-awareness, that these are areas where like computing's got nothing on us. And so as we're designing our, our gifted services and our gifted programs, these are areas that we really want to focus on because these are areas where, um, where we think that, that we can most support students to get them to what success will look like and what career and college ready will look like in our current environment versus you know, maybe 20 years ago. Um, so I think a really interesting thing is if you look at these, these things, these uh, creativity, emotion and empathy, planning, executive functioning and consciousness. And then you look at our gifted goals that, that we encourage for stu uh, students to pick on their EPs. It's loading slowly on my screen, <laughs> I apologize. Um, these are right in line with those elements. So we have our 
emotion and empathy. Um, talking about communication and cooperation with others, our goal four here, looking at and appreciating differences within our, our population, within groups, going from being a good communicator and a good group member to actually becoming a good leader. Um, we have uh, creativity, so creative thinking and expression um, is one of our, our goals that we encourage our gifted students to select. Um, having that self-concept, -con that positive self-concept and positive self-confidence, um, that self-awareness or consciousness that we want our students to have, that executive functioning or self-directed learning. So these goals really do, you know, they're here for a reason and, and really can't go wrong with any of the goals that we pick. Um, if, if we have done EP meetings before, you'll see I typically encourage students to pick even a strength-based goal and a goal that they want to maybe improve upon. Um, because I think that these goals have, have room to not just be things that are, are things that the students feel negative about, that they feel like they need to fix in themselves, but to also think about these things as where, where are my strengths? What am I really good at? And how can I even take those to the next level? Um, so that does just line right into uh, what we feel like needs to be our, our, our goals and how we can best support our students. Um, so let's look at kind of what that looks like in middle school, and then we'll look at what that looks like in our 912 program. Just kind of that was the, we've kind of gone through the why, we've kind of gone through the what, and so this is sort of more of like the how. So how do we make these goals happen? How do we follow up with our students? So in the 6-8, in that middle school program, um, I have very close consultation with all of the teachers in that 6-8. Um, our middle school teams of teachers are amazing, and I don't say that lightly. Um, we have fantastic teachers and they're as a core work so closely together and with me so that I know what's going on in their classes. I talk to the teachers about how the students are doing, if they're um, seeming to need more challenge or need more support, and we can talk about strategies for how that works. Um, and then our teachers are also um, in the middle school in particular they use a concept called universal design for learning as they are planning their lessons. So if you're not familiar with universal design for learning, the idea of that is to look at, at the why, the what, and the how of learning and to meet students where they are. Um, it's kind of what, you know, a, a step up from just that idea of differentiated instruction and really, trying to connect with students on why is what I'm learning important? Why does this matter to me personally? And forming that affect, that um, kind of connection with what they're learning. And then what am I learning? How am I actually going about that process of learning? So looking at those executive functioning skills, that metacognition as they're learning new information. And um, so this is something that in all of our general education core classes in particular, that they are implementing these universal design for learning um, for our students to really meet where our students are in, in that moment. Um, this is also really helpful because, you know, even for gifted students, sometimes they get to maybe one topic in math that they're like, yes, I'm on it, I got it, and they're flying through and they need more challenge, but then maybe they hit that next topic, maybe it's geometry and they have some like more challenges with that visual spatial side. And so then they need a, a different kind of element. Like they don't need that instruction way up here. They need that extra scaffolding um, into what they're learning. And so this, uh, we feel like allows us to be the most flexible in meeting the students where they are for every topic that they're being taught. Um, Standards-based grading, I think is also been an improvement. I know for parents, sometimes it's a little hard as, as you're getting used to it to figure out like, okay, what does this mean again? Um, but the idea behind standards-based grading is the idea that we're not hunting for a specific grade, but we're understanding that this learning is a process and that 
my goal is not just to be proficient and, and get that, but like, what can I then even do to reach that mastery level? And understanding that, you know, you may not start a, a new topic and be at mastery at the very beginning, um, that that is a process and that things can be resubmitted or that that, that is going to, um, to increase their, their where they are with that information has that ability to increase um, as they go. Our middle school team is also amazing at addressing social and emotional learning. Um, that's something that in their conversations with students and how well they know their students, um, that, that they're really uh, a strong team, all, all three of the teams, sixth, seventh, and eighth, at, at recognizing and supporting our students as as humans and, and addressing some of those social and emotional aspects of their learning too. That idea of mindset, for example, um, is something that all of our teachers are, you know, are, you know, talk about and bring up in their teaching. Um, the middle school is also continuing to add more electives. We really want to give our students lots of opportunities to have varied learning experiences. So the arts, the engineering, um, not just the paper and pen arts, but the digital arts as well. So our goal is really, and over last year, and then we have more electives this year that we're really trying to broaden that, um, that elective opportunity for our students so that they have more um, options and more things that, more experiences that they get to have. So in terms of what it looks like for me, for those gifted supports, um, this year on, typically on Wednesdays, not today, but Wednesdays, I usually open up my Zoom room and hold lunch bunches. And I'm available every Wednesday in Zoom for those students at home, or I will often on the other days even um, wander around the cafeteria. <laughs> the kids are pretty used to seeing me outside um, at lunchtime. And so sometimes students will wave me over and we'll you know, chat informally for a little while. I also will, on days where the weather is good, will park myself outside by the office. And so students know that they can come um, and meet with me outside for those lunch bunch open office hours. Um, in Canvas, I also have a gifted shell, looks like one of their courses. Um, there are different resources that are posted there, some videos, um, other kinds of things for, um, for the students to access. And then um, I also do have individual and small group meetings with students by appointment. So on that gifted Canvas page, there's actually a gifted request form that students can use to request a meeting with me, or they can always Canvas message me, or sometimes kids will find me in the hall and ask if we can meet um, on campus. And so um, I, I do that pretty often um, where I will set up times and I might pull a student out of a class for a few minutes or we might find time before or after or during lunch. But, um, but I do meet with students and either individually or in small groups by request. Additionally, I teach, uh, I teach an elective class. So I am the sixth and seventh grade engineering teacher. So I do get to see a lot of our gifted students in my classroom. Um, and then next year, I will actually also be taking on an eighth grade engineering class um, as well. So I will, you know, hopefully get to continue uh, working with some of those, those kiddos that I've had as sixth and seventh graders this year. Um, I'm trying to, you know, get to come back <laughs> to engineering in eighth grade with me too. Um, so that's uh, another place where I get to interact directly with those students. Again, in middle school, our, our primary focus is this idea of asynchronous development, meeting our students where they are at their various areas of development and helping to support those areas where they still need a little bit more of that support. We want to make this foundation really strong for them because the idea is that as they move to high school, this is where we can look at that acceleration. This is where we can look at that more. Um, and I think that that foundation that we're giving our kids in middle school is where now this part of it can blossom. So again, I'll do another book plug. <laughs> but, uh, these are some great books. This one is a little bit more of like a practical, almost like a manual for students. And I'll talk about this one in a second. Um, this book here, uh, 
I'm going to butcher her, her last name. A lot of times they just call her the Waj, um, <laughs> Esther Waj, Waj Siki, um, has wrote this book on how to raise successful people. She is the mother of three amazing girls, one of whom is was the CEO of YouTube, um, one who was the, uh, or who founded and is the CEO of 23andMe, and another who is a professor in, I believe, bioengineering, um, but now I'm going to second guess myself. Um, but the idea is just that in high school, our hope is that we have provided our students with such a good foundation in their development and supported that asynchronous development to to give them that foundation that they can become resilient, that they can become independent, that they can become, um, you know, they can hit those successes in areas that they are passionate about. And so in high school, with this four by four schedule that we have, this actually gives students a lot of opportunities to accelerate if they want to, or to take classes that interest them, that they feel passionate about without feeling like they're sacrificing something in their schedule. So now I'm with a four by four, instead of having six classes per school year, students have the potential to take eight classes in a school year. Um, so if your student is you know, very focused on maths or sciences, you know, if they're interested in sciences, they can, they can have a, a quicker pro uh, progression in their sciences and reach potentially more AP level or go into dual enrollment. This is where we also have that honor. So we have that added challenge that can um, be added at this point. Um, for courses that PK Young doesn't offer, for example, like an AP psychology, meteorology, there are SLVS courses that our students sometimes take in addition to their schedule um, that can allow your student to, to find those pursuits that really interest them and have that added in there without sacrificing um, the things that need to kind of be done um, for graduation requirements. So um, again, and I'm happy to talk I, from my background there, I, I know a lot about those FLVS courses and, and can offer suggestions and, um, and tips on those, but, but that's something that I talk to our student, our high school students about sometimes as well. Again, as far as um, my role in the high school, um, just like with the middle school right now on Wednesdays, I offer a lunch bunch session for our high school students during lunch. Um, they don't like talking to me quite as much as the middle schoolers do, but I'm here <laughs> all the time for that. Um, again, I have our Canvas page that again is set up just like a course in Canvas would be. Um, they can still schedule individual and small group meetings. I do have a few students that meet with me regularly. Um, and then starting next year, a new service that we are adding is that all of our ninth graders are going to be enrolled in a learning strategies class. And so I'm gonna take on one of those courses more specifically for our gifted students to work on some of that executive functioning and learning strategies that will um, kind of apply to that transition of middle school to high school and that focusing in on finding their passions. And so, as you guys likely know, one of the big kind of hallmark things about being a PK student is as a senior completing your research project. Um, we had a, a 12th grader today come into my engineering classes and present his senior project to my students um, and talk about his, uh, he was designing prosthetics um, and actually 3D printed them and everything. So he came and delivered his presentation and uh, it was just very cool to see that, that progression. And, and I feel like our students, even though they were sixth and seventh graders could see that like, this is a culminating thing when you get up here as a senior. Um, but as the student told him, like you have to find something that you're really passionate about for these projects because they are hard and they take a lot of time um, to do a good job on these senior projects. And um, so it's, that, you know, I would love to see this starting in this ninth grade, thinking about what are some passion projects. Not only do we want our students to know more content or to know more, but really it, that knowing isn't, it's wonderful, but 
if you can actually get them to do something with it, that's where the magic really happens. Um, and that's where I have used this book in the past with students and, and projects. And I really encourage students like, okay, yes, you're interested in this. Yes, we can research this. But what can we do with this? What can we make with this? How can you share your ideas with other people? And I think this is really where we have lots of opportunities just in our community even and then our surroundings with UF um, that we can really give our kids a lot of really unique tools to actually take things that they're passionate about and that they're interested in and, and take that to a broader community and actually give them a platform and give them that structure to help them to get there. So whether we're talking about senior projects or even beyond, um, this will be one of the, the things that we talk about in that ninth grade learning strategies course too, um, is how to take just not just the what of what are we learning, but then what does that next step look like? So when you look at your EPs, at your gifted education plans, the service is called consultation. And again, that is me communicating with the students, with um, the teachers, and you getting that progress report each semester. Um, but I do encourage students, we, we want them to become self-advocates. We want them to be able to, to reach out if they need support. So the level of support that I give is really related to what, what a students or what parents or what teachers are telling me that you need. Um, and so you know, we have an amazing team here at PK, um, and definitely I just want you guys to know that I am here for you and for your student and to answer questions, um, but, you know, definitely encourage your kids, too, that if they're, you know, having questions, you know, remind them, like, hey, don't forget, you've got that Canvas shell with Mrs. Babs info, like, send her a message or, um, you know, fill out that little gifted request form or you can let me know um, too and, and we can arrange those times to meet and start those um, more individualized conversations. So again, you know, as, as we said at the beginning, I hope that this was an introduction and that this is really just a beginning. Um, I am so excited to get to work with these students sixth grade through 12th grade and and follow them that whole time, I think is an amazing opportunity. Um, and I know that we are all here for, for providing our students all the success that we can set them up for. So that's all of my information. Feel free to contact me anytime. All right. And thank you so much, Lisa. Um, now we can take some questions. I don't see any questions in the Q&A that um, we're coming in throughout the presentation. Just wanted to make sure we held space if there are any questions. Oh, we do have something. Here we are. Oh, we just got a thank you. Yeah. Let's see. Okay. Yeah, but doesn't I think I've seen a raised hand, but I'm not sure if the way that the webinar is set up actually allows us and yeah. with the way it's recorded allows us to have that back and forth, but um, definitely um, feel free to, you know, to write the questions. Okay, here we are. Okay, so um, a gifted 11 year old girl that is more emotional than her peers, is that usual? Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Um, so, and you know, when we talk about the, this asynchronous development, it's definitely not that um, that that it applies to all students. That all gifted students have, you know, are are lower than their grade level peers in terms of emotions. Some aren't, um, but the idea is that it's not at all uncommon for our gifted students to really struggle with feeling things very intensely when they feel things. And so, um, you know, there's also a, a real idea of like justice and what right and wrong means, what's okay and what's not okay. And um, I can tell lots of personal stories <laughs> of this, like why my kid still doesn't eat pancakes after like 
uh, five years of <laughs> like not being okay because his brother got pancakes and he didn't think that was fair given the situation. It was a lot. So justice, um, <laughs> like emotions, um, intensities, we definitely see that a lot with our gifted students that a kind of things can just be extra <laughs> a little bit. So it is not unusual. And those are things that I, I talk with students about um, their, their emotional kind of side of their development and why things might frustrate them more um, than you know, uh, their grade level peers seem to just let things roll off their back, but they can't quite shake it. So test anxieties, um, imposter syndrome, feeling like they shouldn't have been labeled gifted because they're struggling in something can be really frustrating for our gifted kids. Um, there's a lot of challenges. There's another, it's just a comment says this was great information and this would also be helpful for elementary parents as well. Completely agree with that. Yeah, we'll be looking to make sure that we expand this across K-12 because we also think that this would be great for everybody K-12 and especially elementary too. And also just a thank you, Ms. Fabulich. And we have one more that says, um, I have a highly anxious, gifted sixth grader. Do you provide resources for coping with anxiety? Yes, um, it is definitely something that I meet with some students on. Um, I do it more individually at this point, um, but I would be happy to, especially I think as we move in the future and you know more, normal times, uh, I would love to, to have like small groups and let the kids talk about some of those things because um, anxiety is, is something that a lot of our kids are experiencing. Sometimes that just comes from a lot of being aware of their environment and, and really picking up on a lot of other stresses and a lot of other things going on. Um, and so that is definitely something that I have a few students that I, I meet with individually. And so I'm happy to do that. And my email is on the screen and feel free to reach out to me and, um, and we can definitely arrange that. Yeah. We also have counselors who specialize yeah. in social emotional things as well. So sometimes we have our gifted students who are struggling with that anxiety piece. Um, and sometimes it also might not have to do with something specifically in the gifted context. It might have to do with anxiety in a, in a separate mental health context, even though those are overlapping. And so we also have counselors too. So if you wanna reach Absolutely. out to them, happy to provide support. And then we also have a thank you so much. And this, <laughs> this is great. I definitely want to explore the program options. So wonderful seems like this was really great for everybody. And um, it was just, I felt like it was so helpful in thinking broadly about gifted while also zooming in and helping us think about individual students. Like it did both of those things at the same time. And specifically, I really appreciated the discussion about the asynchronous development and how that can play out for our kids. And then also how that helps us program for our students here at PK. Um, and I look forward to the future webinars about book studies, like you mentioned, <laughs> so we can all just geek out more about this information together because it's such amazing, really helpful information for families to know how to understand their student. Um, and I okay. think kids need to understand that too, is that they need to understand that about themselves and that there are reasons for some of the things that they feel and that that's not putting them in the, like, that they're not weird for sometimes having the struggles that they're they're having. And yes, I know we are recording and I see that question just popped up. We are recording and this will be posted on that family uh, webinar link in the student and family services. Yeah, so let me, I can speak to that a little bit more specifically too. So if you wanna go back and review this webinar because there's so many great in, pieces of information here around books and other things, 
This is going to be shared several places for families. So it's going to be shared via email. It's also going to come out on the announcements on the web. It'll be on social media and then it'll be on the PK website at the student family services page. Uh, also, we meet with families each day. And so we're sharing these webinars as we're meeting with families. Um, and also, if you found this helpful, please feel free to share this webinar with other PK families or other family members or friends. Um, because it just helps get the word out to everybody and especially everyone in our PK community. Um, so we're so grateful for your time and for joining us today and uh, reach out if you would like to continue the conversation. We look forward to it. All right. Thank you guys.